So good evening everybody, my name's Rosemary Dean, I'm Vice Principal Education and Dean of the Doctoral School here at Royal Holloway and I'm very, very pleased to be introducing tonight's inaugural lecture by Laura Spence. I'm particularly pleased to be doing it because Laura got her chair in 2011 and at that time I was Dean of the faculty that her school was in and in those days we didn't have the very organised approach to promotion that we have now, not that it wasn't professionally you understand but in the now everyone's results are all announced at once but in those days if somebody got through at a particular meeting because their references had arrived you were allowed to tell them straight away which has its charm although I can see that for the people who haven't yet heard it's not so good but anyway so the day that uh, the promotions committee decided that Laura had fulfilled what she needed to to get a chair um, I was walking back onto the first floor of founders which is where Laura's office is and I saw Laura in the corridor and I said Laura you've got your chair and she was carrying a cup of tea and lots of papers <laughs> and she nearly dropped a lot <laughs> so it's particularly nice to welcome Laura tonight to give her inaugural lecture and um, Laura's PhD was from Brunel University in Buckinghamshire College and it had a very intriguing title, Comparative European Business Ethics, so you can see the link with tonight. Comparison of the ethics of the recruitment interview in Germany, the Netherlands and the UK. An application of Irving Goffman's frame analysis. I've always liked Irving Goffman's theory ever since I was a sociology undergraduate, so I'm pleased to see that it fits into that as well. Before that, she did a master's at the Rotterdam School of Management uh, in the Netherlands. Um, so she's been Professor of Business Ethics since 2011 here uh, and she's been at Royal Holloway since 2008. So from 2008 until she got her chair, she was a reader. Before that, she was a lecturer and then senior lecturer and reader at Brunel Business School at Brunel University. And before that, she was a senior researcher in the Small Business Research Centre at Kingston University. Since then, she's also been a visiting professor at various places, including Nottingham University, Cardiff University, and Copenhagen Business School. She's taken lots of roles in various organisations. For example, she's a representative at large. That sounds interesting. Um, perhaps as a representative at small as well. <laughs> uh, Academy Management Social Issues in the Management Division. And she's been the Supply Chain Sustainability School um, for the UK Construction Industry member of the Academic Practitioner Horizon Group and a trustee of the Institute of Business Ethics from 2011 till now, and also vice president of the International Society for Business, Economics and Ethics. She speaks English, Dutch and German, but I'm sure you're relieved to know that tonight is going to be in English, so you won't be testing the Dutch. Um, she's supervising a number of PhDs and examined many more. She has been an external examiner at various universities in the UK, and she teaches on a number of courses, including Economic and Social Foundations of Sustainable Organisations, Business Sustainability in Society, Business Ethics and Enterprise. And she's also involved with the MSc in Entrepreneurship and the MSc Sustainability and Management, which is jointly with the Geography Department. Her research interests, as you might guess, include business ethics, but also corporate social responsibility from a range of organisational perspectives, in particular, the lens of small and medium-sized enterprises. And she's had a number of interesting research projects, but some current ones are a fellowship for the world-class research environment governing responsible business, a seminar series from the Economic and Social Research Council on corporate social responsibility among small and medium-sized enterprises from emerging and developing economies, and a project which ran from 2013, it goes up to 2019, London 2012 Olympics Sustainability Project, which includes funding from the Higher Education Funding Council and Commission for Sustainable London. So, as you can tell, she's had uh, a very star-studied career already, and I'm sure she'll go on to do many more things. She's written lots and lots of journal articles, which I won't read out tonight, but we can supply them afterwards if you want. Uh, and she's also been involved in three edited books, the most recent of which is Crane, Matten and Spence, Corporate Social Responsibility, Reading and Cases in a Global Context. So tonight's topic then is the business of business ethics and the ethics of business. Laura Spence. First things first, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you to the hecklers at the front. So, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Rosemary. I really appreciate the um, Let's see if I can uh, respond in the appropriate manner. 
Um, so business ethics is my thing. I think I pride myself on having given you the most confusing title in the history of inaugural lectures. It really took a, an expert in grammar to work out where all the capital letters and so on would come. But what I want to talk today about is the subject of business ethics um, as it exists um, in practice and particularly obviously in scholarship since that's my world. And um, a little bit then also about the ethics of business practice. So I'll look there particularly to draw on some of my own um, research and work. Um, I came to business ethics um, from a business background um, from my family who are here today um, to study business at Bath University partly because I simply didn't know what else to do and I was just looking to keep my options open and I would say to the younger members of the audience there is nothing wrong with keeping your options open. I think I was well into my 20s before I knew what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, and, and I really, uh, really enjoyed um, studying business, uh, business from a sociological perspective. And when I was in uh, Rotterdam, the Erasmus School of Management, uh, there we actually studied business ethics as a subject. Um, and that was one of the first courses in, in Europe. Um, and I really got on with it. Without trying too hard, it made sense. It clicked for me. I know it, I felt like it was meaningful and I think and again to the younger members of the audience that's something you need to look for in what you want to do in life something that that clicks and and works for you um, having um, then worked in Germany after graduating I was confronted with business practice um, as a as an undergraduate or not as a as a recent graduate and I at that point um, expected to change the world to make the world a better place I still ridiculously do expect to, to change the world and make it a better place. Um, but I realized quite quickly that as a 21, 22 year old in a company where there were the pressures and strains of, of meeting deadlines, uh, making a profit, keeping the business running, um, I really started to realize how difficult it was from inside an organization, particularly when you're at one of those lower, lower runged positions to really make a difference on your own. I was even confronted with um, being asked uh, by the company I was working with and some of my colleagues who I respected perfectly, um, good people, um, asked to do something unethical, um, even illegal at that point. And I, I struggled with my conscience um, and in the end did what I was asked to do, you know, really kind of uh, against my, my instincts in, in many ways. And I said to them, don't ask me to do that again. And that was, that was my kind of stand um, that, you know, I can appreciate there are times when we have to do things that we don't want to do. At some point you have to make a decision about what you're willing to, to uh, enter into. And it was uh, at that point I started thinking that perhaps business practice isn't the world for me. Um, no, where could I really make a difference? And it was then that I thought, well, um, I loved university. Absolutely loved it as an undergraduate um, and at Rotterdam as well. Um, so let me go back there. And I I'm really have been very fortunate in finding, finding a, a way of life which suits me, um, you know, leaves me stimulated and, and enjoying what I'm doing, and a chance to kind of multiply through teaching, through research, through engagement with practice, my ideas are about business ethics. So that's the preamble, if you like. Um, let's get on with uh, what, what it's all about, business ethics. So, good, we're all functioning. Uh, so, what is business ethics? Well, um, imagine the scene. I'm at a party. It might be one of the kids' parties. It might be a, a normal sort of party. Um, I meet somebody new, and she says, sooner or later, so what is it that you do? And I know at that point there's different directions the conversations might go in. I know I'm going to have to say I'm a professor of business ethics. Um, but the minute I do... I also know there's going to be one of those kind of tumbleweed moments where there's a pause, a pregnant pause, where the, the cogs start whirring around and they think, what? <laughs> um, no, it can go at that point any one of a number of ways. One of them is, yeah, businesses don't have any ethics, do they? Um, it's an oxymoron. Um, it can go in terms of, oh my goodness me, well yeah, there's been some horror stories in the papers, haven't there, about the terrible things that business um, get up to. Uh, sometimes they say, are you religious? Which I have had, and I am not religious, so that I never really know quite where to go with that one. Um, and then sometimes, and this has really increased over the years, they say, ah yes, yes, 
We do stuff like that at work. We talk about corporate citizenship or corporate social responsibility, maybe sometimes literally business ethics or sustainability. Yeah, yeah, I had a training course on that one. Or we, I had to sign, to sign a code of practice, um, whatever it might be. So, so I've, I've sort of observed a change in the responses when I say I'm a professor of business ethics over the years. And it's quite gratifying to, to hear that it's really, really has, is becoming something that people have at least heard of. <laughs> um, so these uh, conversations, however, have prompted me uh, you know, and for the purposes of this lecture, to really start thinking a little bit more about this what is um, business ethics question. So I have come up with this diagram, which I'm thinking of getting printed onto cards, so next time I'm asked I can just give them a card and, uh, and we can move on and talk about something more interesting. Um, but uh, what I am going to use you, not quite as guinea pigs <laughs> tonight, but I'm going to talk through some of these areas. I mean, it would be too much to take you to plough through every single aspect, but the ones that have a darker ring around the edge, if you can, yes, you can see it. I'm going to get into a little bit more detail about um, some of them more so than others. The, the, uh, about half of the, the talk tonight will be on the social role of business. That's uh, something I'm, I think is particularly key to understanding business ethics. So without further ado, let's uh, move on to the first one, the oxymoron and the scandal perspective. And this is a, a, a bit of a bugbear of mine. It gets up my nose a little bit that, uh, that we get this response, which is why I wanted to, to tackle it head on for the sake of this lecture. Um, first of all, let's not forget the good things that business bring. Uh, it's easy for someone who is uh, naturally critical like me, and I'm paid, it's my job to poke holes in things and to find problems and you know, uh, identify difficulties with situations. But it is not lost on me at all that business does bring a lot of good to society. So um, in terms of employment, for example, we often hear about the NHS and how the NHS is, a, is the sort of single biggest employer but the public sector accounts for less than 20% of employment in the country. So over 80% of people are employed by private sector organisations. So that's a good thing uh, in its own right. Taxation. There are always problems around corporation tax. That's one of your, your scandals that people will, will throw, at, throw at me at those parties. Um, but in 2014 to 2015, uh, 43 billion pounds were paid in corporation tax. So that's money into the coffers. I'm sure it could be more. There's a lot that could be said about taxation issues. In some places, um, you might say in this country, kind of relating to the big society agenda, but I'm thinking particularly of developing and emerging, e emerging economies, uh, businesses take on a pseudo-governmental role. So they will provide education for children of employees. Um, they'll provide health care for their employees. There are all kinds of issues around that because they're, of course, not providing health care for the, for the neighbouring family, only for people that work for their organisation. But they do have a kind of pseudo-governmental role in some places, kind of plugging welfare gaps. And of course, they provide goods and services. Maybe they sometimes advertise um, and create needs in young children who want Christmas presents because they see them advertised on the telly. <laughs> that sort of thing goes on. They generate wealth for shareholders. And in instances, they create meaningful work. You know, if you work for um, a prosthetic limbs manufacturer and you are able to design and create um, a, a prosthetic leg or something that really helps somebody's life, there must be some real good meaning in that work and even just the pleasure um, that you might get out of your daily working life. So I don't mean to suggest through this lecture that businesses are bad, that's not what I'm trying to say. Um, I'm saying there is a complicated role of business in society and, and it's the job of people like me to identify some of those, those uh, issues. So let's crack on with this oxymoron business and particularly scandals. Now you'll recognise um, from some of those images, I'm sure, the dark clouds over Tesco's. Um, that was, that's uh, from an article written by the ACCA, the Accounting Association, um, who talk about the difficulty, the financial difficulties that Tesco got into um, in overblowing their financial statements. Financial issues crop up again, again, and again in this field. Uh, the one on the top left, 
no, top right for you, sorry, um, is Amazon. Amazon Warehouse, I you know, am busy buying Christmas presents and things for, for Christmas over Amazon. I'm conscious that there are ter ter has been accusations, terrible working conditions in Amazon in the warehouse, and also amongst the white collar, -collar workers. You know, real, real concerns about the, the, um, the sort of labor standards in Amazon, which is not um, a small company in India somewhere. You know, these are, these are sort of Western companies, which there is a huge assumption um, incorrectly made that, that the working standards will be um, excellent within those. Um, we have the, the sort of classic case of Nike Primark Gap using suppliers in a developing country context um, going to the bottom of the pyramid to, to really get the cheapest production processes possible, not always passing those savings on to their customers, I might add. Um, and despite quite complex audit processes, evidence emerging again and again and again of poor working practices, poor labor standards, um, and you know, difficult working conditions for the people that work there. And then we have, anybody recognize the chap there? That's the chief executive of um, VW, Martin Winterkorn. Um, you know, looking, that look of despair I thought was extraordinary. VW, though, uh, generally seen as a good upstanding company, um, was caught out, caught out um, for, for messing around with the emission standards. So people that are buying one of the VW cars because it has low emissions, actually they were being tricked. And to be fair, other companies are now emerging as also having done this. So the, the sort of uh, personal despair shown by people in leadership positions and the responsibility they have to take you know, is an important one here. Um, so, yes, there are scandals. I can open a newspaper every single day of the week, and even every type of newspaper, from tabloid to broadsheets and, and everything in between, and there will be something on business ethics. It's great for teaching. Wonderful. Every week I can say, you know, what's happened this week. Makes life, life easy in that respect. Um, so there is no shortage of scandals. But I, in many ways, am as interested in normal businesses, not just the things that make the headlines. No, we don't so often hear about normal business practice. Um, what we do get is absolutely bombarded by media representations of business, which I think, again, don't tell the whole story. So whether it's um, The Apprentice, which I love to watch as an entertainment program, but it drives me nuts that that's, people think that's what business people are like. No, it is an enter entertainment program. They are caricatures of business people. Obviously, they edit it um, to make it of, of maximum entertainment value. One for the older members of the audience, um, Dallas JR was, of course, a classic evil um, business person, the wolf of, of Wall Street, and the Wall Street films show, you know, extraordinary greed, extreme greed, and, you know, the absolute sort of pinnacle of the worst uh, kind of greed at any cost. It exists, but it's way up the end of the spectrum. And then we have the kind of bumbling idiot businesses, uh, 40 Towers, uh, the sort of trotter independent enterprises and the office, which, which suggests that business people you know, really don't know what they're doing and they're flat faffing around, um, and they're not really achieving anything. Well, I've, got, um, I've spent enough time speaking to business people, and particularly and those examples would probably be more of the smaller enterprises, um, to really have a lot of respect for people that run businesses, people that, that um, say to me when I talk about responsibility, say, well, yeah, you know, I'm responsible for four people's mortgages. I've got my own and my, got my three employees. And every month I worry about whether I can get those four mortgages paid. That seems to me an extraordinary lev level of responsibility and doesn't chime at all with the kind of uh, 40 towers approach to, to running business life. And then we've got the kind of honour amongst thieves expectations around business, whether it's the Mafia and the Sopranos or the Spectre organisation in the James Bond film um, or indeed Oliver Twist and the gang of thieves and pickpockets where you know, the purpose of their activity is a bad one. It's uh, breaking the law, stealing things, um, but there is a certain amount of love and care and attention within the group. So there are all kinds of things going on in the media, um, very few of which are tremendously helpful. So I would urge you to kind of not be uh, caught up and foxed by, by the uh, media images. So um, for me, business ethics is not an, an oxymoron. 
Um, it's a way of understanding the world from a moral perspective. Um, now, I'll go on to explain that more in terms of the business ethics scholarship that myself and colleagues in this room um, have been, been crushing away at and working on. And business ethics is a scholarly subject, and that's not to say that business ethics didn't exist before this, um, but in terms of being named explicitly as a scholarly, scholarly subject, comes from about the 1970s, um, particularly in the United States, from the uh, kind of management uh, studies field where people started talking about what's the role of business in society um, and particularly identifying um, the, the uh, kind of the limits of the role so saying actually if a business is owned by shareholders then the responsibility is to maximize return to their shareholders um, not to start making investments in social products that was Milton Friedman's argument the business of business is business not kind of social welfare stuff and that is brought out you know, as a starting point to many a business ethics course to this day because it does kind of put a stake in the ground. Is, is that what we're talking about? But alongside that, we have uh, the sort of uh, part of business ethics which emerges from philosophy and from moral philosophy. So people who at one time might have looked at medical ethics, nursing ethics, legal ethics, accounting ethics, other professional groups, have start, started to look at business practice and the, the actions and practices of managers as, as professionals. Um, and that's also a kind of stream of, of activity that um, comes through to business ethics scholarship. And there's other aspects in economics, in environmental studies, in geography, um, in sociology, you can find people working on topics which absolutely overlap with business ethics. And we are starting to see those conversations come together. It's a regret of mine that there is still a siloed approach to business ethics scholarship. Um, but that's something that certainly myself and others are, are, are fighting to, to work against. So I'm an academic. I cannot avoid giving you definitions. That's our kind of stage one. <laughs> Um, so just to pick out a, a couple of, of things here, you can, you can read them all, I'm sure. Um, really, uh, at the heart of things, I suppose, is morality, so understanding the social, cultural norms and, and mores of life, um, which we then uh, try to study from the perspective of moral and ethical theory. Um, so business ethics colleagues that have uh, been and um, joined us at Royal Holloway at different times, Crane and Matten, they say business ethics is the study of business situations, activities and decisions where issues of right and wrong are addressed. I would really like to sort of emphasise adding to that the work of Patricia Wohain, who talks about moral imagination and the need for us to understand the different contexts of business ethics and to be able to, to read what's happening in a situation from different perspectives. Um, Corporate social responsibility, I might use the, the phrase CSR to short for that, that's what I mean by CSR, um, is really about looking at positive social change, so how organisations might be engaged in possible positive social change. That draws from the work of uh, Ruth Aguilera and uh, Keith Davis before her. But my favourite, <coughs> always there's a favourite, comes from work uh, by sociologist Robert Jackal from the 19, um, 1980s, 1988, and his work Moral Mazes. He talks there after spending time um, as a participant observer in one a large American organisations, he talks there about understanding the moral rules in use in organisations. As you'll, you'll see, um, I have a particular issue with a focus on, on rules in business ethics, so I would expand that to say it's, it's about understanding moral perspectives in use in organisations. So that is what I try to do when I'm doing research, when I'm, I'm speaking with students, when I'm speaking with businesses is draw on the different moral perspectives which, which I and we can identify in the practice um, that we're, we're observing. So that's what I mean when I refer to, to business ethics. So hopefully we're dispatched with um, thinking about oxymorons and scandals, we've dispatched with um, a little bit about what is this field of business ethics scholarship. And we can look now to really starting to think about some of the application of ethics to um, a practice. But in order to do that, and uh, it's really unwise of me to do this, but hey, you know, she who dares, um, I feel I need to give you a whistle-stop tour of eth ethical theory. It's insane what I'm about to do, but I'm going to do it anyway. 
So I do not expect you to go away. Are you all ready, sitting comfortably, remember being a student? <laughs> um, what, all, what I want to do with this, and these are the, the ethical theories which I draw on most commonly in my teaching and research. There are others, that's something we might come on to. Um, but what I do is try to um, use these theories to help understand and explain um, and identify business practice and think about you know, what the implications are of the ethical theories. Um, really the purpose of showing you this table is to show you how different different perspectives can be. Maybe that's obvious. Um, but so if we talk about Kantianism, for many people, Kant's approach to business ethics is simply what they mean by the word ethics. So it's, it's following principles, following rules. So Kant is all about identifying um, what your duty is according to his categorical imperative. Lots of lovely long words to get your head around. Um, but it's all about identifying through reasoned log logic um, what the principle is that you should follow. And the principle would be the same for everybody in all situations. So that's Kant's understanding of, of ethics. We would then have utilitarianism, which takes somewhat an opposite view, a consequentialist view, looking at the outcomes of an action. So no matter how good the principle or the rule is, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that the outcome is the greatest good for the greatest number. So really thinking about the, the public good. Um, egoism is a the sort of individual perspective, so looking to the self-interest of the individual. Social contract theory looks at the organisation and governance of a situation. So you know we need to work out the governing situation, which is the the most ethical. Virtue ethics looks at the individual and their character. So we make a judgment about an individual person. Um, discourse ethics looks at the way of arriving at, at a decision and that making sure that there has been a fair and full argumentation and that everybody has had a chance to, to have their input. And then we have the kind of crazy postmodern ethics, um, which is about individual impulses for action. It is rejecting uh, meta-narratives, rejecting the idea that we can come to one single conclusion um, about what is ethical, very anti-Kantian in that respect. And then the ethic of care it focuses on relationships and the quality of the relationships that we have and how we attend to those. So when people say, oh, what, that's unethical, or whatever it might be, or make a judgment, I would always seek to, to get them to think about what do you mean by that? Now, which of these perspectives or some others are you drawing on? To an extent, there's a gut reaction. Um, there's what our mother, mother taught us <laughs> um, about how we should behave. But they, those actions can also be analysed from a moral theory point of view. And while I fully appreciate in business life you might not sit and say, well, what would Kant say about this? Um, there is nothing wrong with stopping and thinking, well, hang on, are we focusing on the principles? You know, is that what's most important to us? And any, is it at any cost we will follow these principles? Are, or are there things that think we must achieve? Or are we concerned about our uh, individual reputation and character? And certainly some businesses organise themselves on the lines of virtue and are looking for particular virtues in the people they employ. So there's all these different ways, and I will mention some of them um, as we go through. So well done. You have just gone through an uh, ethical theory uh, sort of test. <laughs> but I'm not going to test you. So don't worry, don't worry. So I need again to dispatch with something um, which is the ongoing argument, and it is probably the most dominant uh, argument that comes through in business ethics and so social responsibility about the business case. So constantly there is a drive, and this comes from both practice and scholarship, to try to argue that actually, if people are ethical, you know already that that's a complicated statement, but if people are ethical, then they can make money out of that. So it makes sense that people would pursue, um, pursue ethical practice, social re responsible practice, because that's how they'll, they'll make, the, make money. And this is, a, as I say, a long-standing debate, and it goes back to that Milton Friedman argument about the business of business is business, and it encourages businesses and business people to identify perhaps social issues, it might be social opportunities, it might be an environmental product that they can sell um, for profit and also to uh, generate some kind of social good and social value. Sounds good um, on one level, um, but the difficulty here is that it, it keeps us in the old paradigm, if you like. 
whoops, sorry, um, yep. Um, so it emphasizes this idea of the business of business is business, but allows then business organizations to start cherry picking, start picking um, different things that they might um, say, okay, well, we'll this week we'll invest in um, something for the community because we think that will mean that they buy our product. But next week we're not going to do that, we're going to invest in marketing because that will be the more profitable thing to do. Um, so I would associate this, you know, bearing in mind I'm saying we need to think about these from different ethical, theoretical perspectives, with an egoist point of view. So I don't know if you can see the, the cartoon, but the, the guy is saying something on the lines of, lines of dude, we're trapped on this um, island and there's only one coconut for us to eat, what are we going to do? Um, and then the dude says, oh, okay, what I need to do is look out for my own self-interest, cracks the other guy over the head with the coconut and, of course, has the advantage, you know, has indeed looked after their own self-interest at the cost of somebody else. And here we go with um, an ethical egoism approach, is that it, it drives people to make decisions um, on base, based on their own self-interest with no reflection on the implications um, for others. So that starts to become problematic then in terms of, of thinking, well, we, we all live on this planet. Um, you know, if everybody operates in their own self-interest, um, then we, we come to a, an end point very quickly. Um, so where can we go from that there? If this is kind of suggesting that, that social issues are really separate from business practice and business life. Well, there are companies that have really made a, made a virtue of this, there's that word, um, you know, that have really uh, benefited and prospered through pursuing what we might call ethical practice, they might call it sustainable living like Unilever does, um, um, all of these companies, in fact, have won awards for ethical practice, whether it's the most responsible business or um, the one in the middle at the bottom there is Helsinki Stock Exchange. I don't know if anybody knew that. Um, but they, they won an award recently for being the most sustainable um, stock exchange and stock exchange index. We even have a business school in there, Schulich Business School um, in Toronto, uh, won an award for their MBA being the most um, ethically kind of sound MBA approach. So everybody, it seems, can win awards for ethics. Um, and this really has as a part of a, a real kind of steamroller effect, really, um, in the field, um, which centres and has been sort of uh, kicked off particularly by the work of um, Michael Porter and Mark Kramer. So this article, Creating Shared Value, um, is based on you know, a real claim that what businesses need to do is promote the idea of identifying social issues where there is a profit to be made, where there is a, a social value and an economic value. And there is a backstory to this that um, no, I won't have a lo lot of time to deal with, um, but Michael Porter is an absolute huge guru, a strategy guru in the world of business. If, if business people have heard of any one scholar, it's probably Michael Porter. So he has a very, very high cachet. Um, and he works at the Harvard Business School. This journal is a Harvard Business Review journal. Um, and it's really the outlet um, for Michael Porter and his colleagues. And they make huge claims in this article. You know, they are going to reinvent capitalism, re-legitimize business. Bear in mind, this was kind of post the uh, 2008 economic crisis. Um, and really, they, they argue that they've come up with a new way, a better way than previous versions of corporate social responsibility about changing the way that we do business practice. Well, I can't keep out of my voice um, some cynicism towards this. And indeed, um, with colleagues, um, I have been working and we've published in a California, called a California Management Review, a critique. So um, just to... to uh, identify where some of this work has come from, the shared value work, comes from work that um, the Michael Porter and, Porter and Kramer did with Nestle. So they have a consultancy business as well. So again, you know, it, it is in their favour to promote this, the, this approach. And in, in fact, Nestle, which is one of those companies that has had a horrendous reputation in the past, 
has thrown all its efforts into creating shared value and is really a kind of partner in the, the shared value industry. When it is an industry, you know, there is a, a huge, huge amount of money being made um, and indeed through scholarship, you know, the reference, referencing of that article, how we measure um, the sort of popularity of work is, is outstanding, absolutely outstanding. So with Andy Crane, Guido Palazzo um, and Dirk Matten, um, over the many sort of discussions where we were all angry about this article. You don't often get anger amongst <laughs> academics. That's not really our, our approach to life. And we really kind of said, okay, we want to take this on. Let's see what we can do to tackle this. Hope you can, yes, you can read it. Um, so uh, the strengths, you know, trying to be balanced, we identified the strengths of the, the CSV approach um, as including the, the fact that it has been popular, um, it articulates a, a clear role for governments in what they do, it identifies three different ways that businesses can create shared value, um, and you know, it tries to take on this idea of conscious capitalism and the, the change the way that, that business is done. Um, we identified particularly, and there's a whole article obviously you can go and read, um, but, but we identified that it wasn't as original concept as they had claimed. They'd really failed to, uh, to acknowledge the roots of the work in other areas around um, strategic CSR and stakeholder theory. Um, they didn't acknowledge the tensions between social and an economic gain. Um, they uh, stated that companies would uh, comply with the law and ethical norms and then continued the discussion from there, whereas we know, in fact, in practice, the biggest hurdle is trying to identify the compliance with the law in the first place. Um, and all kinds of things, really, that they overlooked. They really encourage companies to just cherry-pick things which are profitable um, and not identify the things where there is a greatest need. Um, so we felt that um, you know, it was really disingenuous. And I'd have to say they even responded to our article and, and business people, which is almost unheard of, have been in touch with us and said, oh, yeah, you know, I knew there was something wrong with that, <laughs> with that approach. So I'm pleased to say that we are having some traction. Um, but no, it's an interesting example of how strategic CSR can kind of overtake um, the world and overtake the argument. It comes up again and again. Um, so, is the business case sufficient to achieve positive social change? My answer to that would be no, it isn't. Um, no, it, leads, it's, it lacks integrity, it leads us to a bit of a kind of one-way street to the point where um, there comes a day when uh, there is no social um, initiative which will make you profit, so then you shouldn't be doing social initiatives. Um, and is it necessary to address the business case? Yes, it is. It is a way that we get talking to business to, to use some of the language of business. But I would also say, um, quoting this uh, interesting chap here, um, and if it's good enough for Einstein, it's good enough for me, um, that we really should be thinking outside of the current system in order to, to move things forward. We're unlikely to find the answers within the system. So... Part two. <laughs> You're sitting comfortably still. <laughs> this brings me uh, to, to uh, home territory for me. Now I can talk to you about some of the, the work that I've been a little bit more closely involved in, um, which is a real treat for me. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a bit more about the social role of business in society. So in a sense, uh, up till now, I've been talking about business as being somehow separated um, from social, social pra practice and social life. Um, we can go on to think about ways in which business and society are kind of joined together in some way. There's a very recognisable chap, Bill Gates, and his wife, Melinda Gates. Um, they do extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary work through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Of course, Bill Gates' um, money, which is poured uh, $29 billion, $29 billion, into uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. That's real money. It makes a real difference to, to poverty-stricken areas, to education and so on. Um, but Bill Gates was no angel throughout his life. Some people have difficulties with Microsoft's approach to domination of the, the IT industry. But he also, you know, the photographs there, he also um, was, was held as um, in violation of antitrust legislation in 1998. <coughs> So while, from a virtue perspective, we might think, what a wonderful person Bill Gates is. I don't, he is a wonderful person for really putting his money where his mouth is. He used to be the most rich person in the world. He isn't anymore because he's given so much of his money. He's still got plenty left. But he's given lots of his money away. You know, that's not a bad thing. 
Um, but we have this situation where someone who has, you know, their gains through life, their wealth, has not necessarily been generated through entirely ethical processes and practices. And we see this in philanthropy, and it, we've seen it a lot closer to home. So my colleagues in the room will recognise what's going on here, where I'm heading with this. So Royal Holloway does not get its name because we're near the Holloway Road, as people often seem to think we must be. Um, Royal Holloway gets its name from Thomas Holloway. Thomas Holloway was a, a Victorian businessman. He made an absolute fortune in Victorian terms um, from selling ointments and powders and pills which since you know, chemically analysed have been shown to do next to nothing in terms of improving your health. So we could say he's, these are ill-gotten gains. Um, but come the end of his sort of working career, um, he said, OK, I want to do something good with my money. Um, you know, and he had a fortune at that point. And he put out a competition and said, actually, we'd like to identify what's the best possible use for a, for a, a quarter of a million pounds. It would be an extraordinary amount of money in that time. And there were two uh, things that he invested his money in. One was Royal Holloway College, which was one of the first women's higher education colleges. That founder's building is a founder named after Thomas Holloway. Um, no, an incredible thing. That was 42 years before women's suffrage in this country on the equal basis as men. So incredibly forward-thinking in a social sense. And the other one was uh, Holloway Sanitarium, which is in Virginia Water, very nearby. So also an extremely good cause. Um, the college was opened in 1886 by Queen Victoria. You can see the statue if you go in one of the quads. Um, that's why we're called Royal. Um, and allegedly, she also used Holloway's ointments. Can't prove that, but that's an, an interesting one. But so Thomas Holloway sold a product that didn't work. He called himself Professor, which, given that I'm here celebrating being a professor, irks me a little bit. Um, <laughs> but apparently, it wasn't that unusual in those days. He lied about his qualifications. He uh, was in debtor's prison at one point. There's suggested rumours that he stole the idea from someone else. All these kinds of things, which you might say, oh, yes, that's unethical business practice. But what fabulous things he did with the money once he'd got it. So there are some intriguing things going on here. So I mentioned utilitarianism, and we could say, on balance, Bill Gates, Thomas Holloway, now while the process of how they got their money is perhaps questionable, certainly goods generated as well, but there are some issues there that we might want to kind of attend to. In the end, the outcome of the good that they did is fantastic, and a utilitarian would say, were any disbenefits that are accumulated, do they uh, outweigh the benefits? And if the benefits are greater than the disbenefits, that's an ethical thing to do. But this, uh, obviously, is a, is a question here. Now, to what extent do we accept how people do things in order to achieve particular goals? Um, and that is a huge discussion amongst utilitarians to this day. Now, what, uh, at what cost? do we achieve some of these greater, greater good goals, um, the greatest good for the greatest number. So if that's a kind of business and society approach, we might say, well, that's not satisfactory. What we need is to think a little bit more about business really being more closely engaged and in society, embedded in society. And this is something um, when earlier on in my career, every business ethics or social responsibility conference you went to, someone from BP would be wheeled out. So this was um, in the sort of uh, early, uh, early 2000s. Um, now, they were always put forward as a great example. They'd rebranded to be beyond petroleum. You know, they were seeking to develop their um, environmental energy approach, um, still obviously a petrol company. Um, now, all the, the, P, the BPs, big picture, big P, better people, better products beyond petroleum. Um, and they really did seem to invest in this. This was under Lord Brown. Leadership is another issue we could, could dwell on here. Um, but then what happens, um, after a change of um, leadership, uh, Tony Hayward took over. Tony Hayward actually, incidentally, was educated at uh, Windsor Boys' School, just down the road. Um, he took over, and he was concerned about costs. He was really uh, you know, worried about the finances, cut costs drastically within BP, promoted innovation, promoted risk-taking um, and, uh, and efficiency. Th those were his drivers. He referred to all the people that were kind of left over from the beyond petroleum days as 
literally a bunch of do-gooders. And his, his sort of attitude was, get the do-gooders out. So meanwhile, all these cost-cuttings are going on. Um, come April 2010, we had this. The Deepwater Horizon di disaster in the Gulf of Mexico. The, the biggest environmental disaster in US history, we're told. Um, and lives are lost, absolutely. Lives are lost, literally, and livelihoods are lost in the Gulf of Mexico area. So we see this, this sort of conflict going on. We start to understand the, the entanglement of business and society. So BP, at that point, still had fantastic health and safety rules. One of, one of the issues was to do with compliance with health and safety. They had super, super health and safety standards. They had gold plaques, award-winning health and safety standards. Um, the investigation afterwards did not critique the standards they had in place or the codes that they had in place. What they did critique was the culture. Um, the culture around health and safety had taken an absolute nosedive under all these um, expectations around efficiency, speed, innovation, and things like health and safety. It was never absolutely perfect, their health and safety culture, I would have to say, but it really was a conflict. It was a tension um, between compliance with health and safety and getting the job done as quickly as possible. Um, and this was one of the causes. It was very compl complex, but it was one of the causes here. So I can't help thinking, what would Kant say? I'm sure all of you are thinking that too. What would Kant say? You know, they have these lovely rules in place, and yet it didn't work out. You know, there was some gap here between uh, the existence of rules and their implementation, and we see this again and again in business um, contexts. So no matter what rules and systems you have, uh, if they are not implemented, if they are not act up acted upon, if they are not kind of ingrained in people's behaviour, um, you can be in very serious trouble. And this is something that I've um, identified in some of the work I'm doing, work with uh, Leonardo Rinaldi, who's in the audience. Um, we did looked at Sainsbury's and we looked at the lamb supply chain. I actually should be a kind of pork chop or a lamb chop or something on there, not a lovely little springy lamb. I couldn't quite bring myself to, to do that. Um, so we looked at how, um, how Sainsbury's, absolutely committed from the top layers, certainly, uh, were committed to embedding sustainability in their supply chain. And we used the Foucauldian approach for this, the, the academics amongst you, to try to, to get at how the processes, the systems they had, all good systems, were to be implemented um, throughout the chain, right from... Um, farmer to fork, they say, right, from the people that are rearing lambs through all the different stages and processes, through their very delightful abattoirs, um, into uh, uh, packaging and redistribution and Sainsbury's shop shelves and onto your fork. Um, and we identified, you know, that all these sustainability processes tend to get reconfigured throughout the life of the supply chain. So using uh, Michel Foucault's work on governmentality, we sought to, to really kind of uncover the power issues that are going on here and the governance issues that are going on and to identify what's called fields of visibility. Now, how can we draw out what is brought to the surface, what is made important, whether that's um, the sort of activities around uh, investing in sustainability processes or how the organisation portrays itself in, in relation to sustainability. Um, we looked at the identif ed identifications within the, the stages of the supply chain and the technologies that were used, whether that's the auditing processes, the accounting packages by which they seek to understand sustainability and sustainable activities. And the forms of knowledge, you know, where does the expertise lie around sustainability? And as I say, beautiful systems, can't argue with the systems, and yet everything, or that they, it's not that they were doing terrible things, but everything kind of got repackaged and translated into their economic meanings. So while speaking to Justin King, the CEO, you know, his vision of sustainability was quite clearly a balanced environmental, social and economic. By the time you get down to the people that are doing the buying um, and working with the, the uh, intermediaries, the, the language has changed into economic sustainability, survival, longevity, and by the time you get to the farmers, it's just about making sure those farms don't collapse and that they're still there for future generations. So we have to be careful, <coughs> I think, is one of my messages um, about understanding systems and you know, the existence of a system does not guarantee anything. <laughs> 
And we've seen this as well in terms of rules. So um, uh, Rosemary mentioned the work we do with the Commission for Sustainable London 2012. Um, and we had great time on Royal, at Royal Holloway. We had some of the rowers here wandering around campus. Um, and locally also, we had some of the events held locally. So we felt really part of the Olympics. I knew at the time that they had a really strong sustainability message. They, there is an argument that it was the most sustainable games yet. Um, you know, we have good connections still with the Commission for a Sustainable London. And they had fantastic systems in place so that organisations could not supply the Olympics. I mean, there was all kinds of issues. But they could not supply the Olympics if they had not su signed up to sustainability. So with colleagues here... Uh, Stefanos Anastasiadis and Enric Kromida, we've been looking at, at the innovation processes that that called and the, and the fact that companies changed what they did in order to be able to the, supply the Olympics. And yet, yet again, you know, despite their uh, outstanding sustainable sourcing codes that they had, um, you know, see some of the, the aspects of it there, they were caught out. So a factory in China making these, these uh, mascots, the, the uh, Mandeville and Wenlock mascots, were found to, be, to have very poor labour standards and to be breaking all these aspects of the code. So again, there is this issue about having some great codes, some great rules, is not quite enough. So this brings me on, you'll be pleased to hear, to, <laughs> to my real home territory. So if we think business and society doesn't really work, doesn't work if you separate business from society or you just kind of blonk business in society, what about if we think about where business is society? Where society is business, business is society. We don't seek to separate them out. We kind of reject the separation hypothesis. But I want to look here particularly at small and medium-sized enterprise, and my small business colleagues will, will know this terrain. Um, but taking a very quick and dirty definition, we're talking here about organisations with fewer than 250 employees, so the small guys. Now, you might think, if you're not familiar with this territory, well, they don't really matter. What we actually need to speak about is BP and Shell and Sainsbury's and all the rest of it. But it is a bit of a, uh, you know, a, a kind of check for you. And I need a couple of volunteers for this. How about you two little chaps? Yeah. Would you stand up, please? We haven't practiced this at all. <laughs> so, so imagine, I have no idea how many people here. Let's say 200, because that works with the statistics. But if we say that there are 200 people here, each of you is a business, a private sector enterprise. Uh, if we think about how many of you would be large organisations, if we look at the UK or Europe as a whole, it would be these two guys. So all the rest of you are small and medium-sized enterprises. So we are really, you may sit. <laughs> Thank you, boys. <laughs> um, so you know, it really surprises people all the time that actually when we're talking about business, we should be talking about the 99%, literally the 99%. 99% of the private sector businesses are those small and medium-sized enterprises. Most of them are really tiny, up the small end, but that, that's, uh, that's not something I'm going to dwell on so much here. But we really, if we want to be relevant to business, must be relevant to small and medium-sized enterprises. So that's kind of part of my mission in life. Um, you know, that's what I work on. And, and I don't necessarily mean some flash IT company. Um, you know, they are out there and they exist as well. But my interests generally tend to lie in normal businesses, normal everyday businesses. Your hairdresser, your mechanic, the, there's one remaining independent shop on the high street. It might be Windsor and Eaton Brewery, which uh, my friends from Windsor will recognise well here. It might be a flag seller in, in Athens during the yes-no votes. It might be a, a hairdresser set up in a container um, in Botswana, these are like my holiday snaps, um, <laughs> or a, or a, uh, so a hangmato, um, people selling, I can't remember what they're called, thanks, hammocks, <laughs> thank you, um, in, uh, that was in Copenhagen. So normal little tiny businesses, you will all know them. So we have the statistics here, um, someone amongst you is thinking, yeah, well, there might be lots of small businesses, but they don't have much impact on the economy, do they? Wrong again. Um, <laughs> so two-thirds of these, are, these are European statistics, two-thirds of people work for small organisations rather than large organisations if we're looking at the private sector. 
And um, no, they generate income as well. They absolutely generate income. 58% of the value added comes from those small and medium-sized enterprises. So I will grant you that any one firm might not have much of an impact, although if you lose your job, you lose your job. It don't, doesn't matter to you how big the firm is. Um, but So individually, they might not have much of an impact, but collectively, actually, that's in many, many ways where the action is. So that is why I do most of my research on small businesses, part of that they're just interesting, really, really interesting beasts. Um, just to highlight uh, quickly some of the differences, so where you would find formal bureaucratic processes in large firms, they're likely to be informalised um, and relationship-based um, approaches in smaller businesses, um, very much reliant on personal relationships, the legacy of the owner-manager and family issues. Um, certainly reputation and status are absolutely key to sort of win business and much more likely to be flat and flexible, used to multitasking um, and really able to offer much more of a personalised service. And these are, these are generalisations, but just to, to help you kind of get away from that large firm um, perspective. So it means that the issues that small businesses are dealing with are more likely to be localised, much more likely to be um, perhaps supporting the local football team, obviously, than England rugby at um, Twickenham, for if, should anybody still want to do that. Um, they're much more uh, bound up with the employee's philanth and sort of philanthro philanthropic approaches, um, pet pro prep projects of the, the owner-manager and their, their employees. And where they sign up to kind of official standards, they're more likely to be industry-specific, um, no, not such just doing a standard for its own sake, but something which was really a requirement for their industry. And we don't hear about these practices. Small businesses often uh, say that they would feel authentic if they went around saying, oh yes, I'm really an ethical business, I do lots of social responsibility. It's much more in a small business likely to be to do with how they live their lives. And this is why I'm saying they're a, a nice example for us to think about business is society. What they do is wrapped up in their life. So you might hear about them from word of mouth. That's the standard um, way of spreading the word about small businesses. And it would be a tiny fraction that you would see getting awards, like I mentioned before, or even getting in the newspaper, even the local newspaper. You, know, you don't often see, th see those things. Um, so one of the issues we have with small businesses is that, as I have been doing up till now, we lump them all together. So imagine 99%, millions and millions of companies, and I've tried to just talk about them as a single group. So something I'm, I'm working on more now is trying to differentiate them in terms of social responsibility. Um, so rather than corporate social responsibility, watch this space for small business social responsibility. So I'm building on work that's just come out very recently um, which separates different typologies of, of business, whether they're growth or subsistence, hedonism or paternalism, and trying to think, well, what might the implications be there for social responsibility? Um, so those growth firms bear in mind um, where kind of the policy uh, attention is directed towards growth firms in the hope that they will become large firms. Um, that is really probably less than 10% of businesses. So again, we start thinking, okay, well, that's still a lot of firms. There's really a lot of firms. But actually, that's maybe not where the majority action is in terms of understanding businesses. <coughs> um, and what I'm going to do just briefly as I, I start, the end is in sight of, of my talk, is just think about some of the implications of this emerging work, trying to understand social responsibility from, from different perspectives of small business life. So just to take the first <coughs> view, if we think about growth firms, um, no, I've done work with Angela here on um, social capital and other colleagues, really thinking about how a firm such as Windsor and Eaton Brewery um, no, is embedded in the local community, has really identified links with the organisations around them, to, to uh, including the local community very much, um, but also other sorts of organisations, to build their business. They draw on somewhat of a large firm model. It's not that much of a surprise because the four people that founded the business come from a large firm perspective. They are absolutely rampant on the social media. You know, they, a lot of their business has been helped by the support of social media. So they, they kind of reflect some of those large firm expectations, um, but do it through building a personality locally and using the social capital that they can garner from their networks and connections. 
Then we might think about a subsistence company. Um, so one which um, is rather more passive in its approach. I'm thinking about uh, one company I interviewed which was a uh, linguistic translation service. It was more or less um, a man and his wife and a few agents that, that they used. Um, and when interviewing them, they kind of shrugged and said, yeah, well, you know, we're doing it just until we get the kids through university. That's why we do the business. I'd love to retire. But really, uh, you know, we've just got to keep it going because we've just got to get the kids sorted out, get them through university and set up on their own two feet. So we're not expecting anything massively dynamic to come from them in terms of social responsibility. That's not a bad thing. That's just the way the business is. Um, and yet they might draw on uh, what we call a stakeholder approach. You know, they are part of an embedded network. Um, in work I've done uh, publishing, well, I'm publishing next year it looks like there, but it is out already in electronic format. Um, I've been talking about how sm some smaller businesses are subject to being part of a stakeholder network, but they're not at the centre of the picture. Normally in stakeholder theory we identify the organisation and we think about the, the sort of uh, key stakeholders around it. They are much more subject to somebody else's stakeholder picture. And that's something that I think is, is somewhat distinctive for the small business point of view. Then just to, to pick up the other two, we might think about hedonistic firms. These might be ones um, which are kind of run almost for fun. You know, people that perhaps have made money elsewhere. I couldn't help thinking here about um, Absolutely Fabulous and Patsy's magazine that she runs and hardly ever seems to do any work. Um, where, where there is perhaps not a huge commitment, but where people, um, to, to the sort of business in itself, but where there is an engagement with others with whom there is moral intensity or social proximity. Um, with some Finnish colleagues, I've been working on that. Really thinking about how the organisation responds to those with whom it has a closeness, um, whether in physical geographical terms, that might be part of it, um, but also beyond that to thinking about social connectedness. That draws from work by hysterically, I think, someone called Tom Jones. It's not the Tom Jones. It's another Tom Jones, but I never can quite get over that. And then finally, this sort of paternalistic organisation. So we might he think here about a family business. It might be um, a freight company, for example, where all the members of the f immediate family are employed, perhaps it's second generation, um, or the spouses of the members of the family are in employed, um, where there is a real engagement with the employees in the organisation and, a, and a, a desire to do the right thing by those employees over the long term. And where there, there might be some signing up to specific standards, if it's the Forest Stewardship Council standards of the boxes of the crates they use to, to move things around. Um, but there is a, a real drive here. And this brings me to uh, kind of my favourite ethical theory, which is the ethic of care. And I just want to dwell on that for a moment longer. For the, the, um, the ethic of care is a little bit different from um, the other theories, as um, I was saying to a colleague earlier. It is the one theory which isn't really populated by a load of dead or very old white blokes. And this is different. It comes from, and it, you know, it's, a, it's a real sorrow to me that, that um, the field is so dominated um, by a masculinist perspective because it makes a difference. And the work of Cara Gil Gilligan really identified this in looking at child development around um, moral development and identified that you hear a different voice if you include women and girls in the studies that you're doing, which in sense, uh, incidentally, uh, women were often not included in sociological and psychological studies because they skewed the results um, around the sort of 1960s era. So guess what? We need to skew the results. Um, so the work of Carol Gilligan has then been developed by um, people like Virginia Held. There are other philosophers I happen to particularly like Virginia Held's work really to identify the importance of relationships. You know, I think that really tunes in to much of the small business work that I've been doing. It accepts that we are not autonomous uh, beings who can make these highly principled decisions. We respond to the people around us and to family and friends particularly, and in turn to employees. And that is not a bad thing because it's not logical and rational. You know, it engages with rationality as well as emotional perspectives. I mean, it acknowledges differences in, in power um, and different uh, agendas within that. So I think that's important. I think uh, it explains a lot about small business perspectives. This is something I've been, been working on most recently, perhaps. And it really um, you know, brings in a, a fresh perspective to to business ethics, there has been work on business um, on the ethic of care in the business ethics field, but not enough, and not 
not high profile enough. And I think it really explains something about small business. So, perhaps it's time to come back to, to my diagram. Um, obviously, there is more that could be said. I could have touched on um, other areas. And I think it's important to identify things that we need to work towards in the future. Um, so, you know, I, I'm hoping to still have another 20 years in academia. Luckily for me, there is so much still to be done. You know, if any of you are thinking of going into academic work, there is plenty of room in business ethics. There's lots, lots more to be done. Um, we need to think about the, the areas I haven't talked about, the environmental, the religious, the political. There is some work in those areas, and I think we need to really make progress now with those. We need to integrate the disciplines so that I don't have to have a star diagram, but we can start think about drawing those um, together. We need to look to other moral theories. So I've been talking particularly about a, a Western theoretical perspective. Some of my students are working using African um, communitarianism, for example, or others have looked used Islamic ethics. You know, there are other ways of looking at the world than the, the sort of Western philosophers that tend to dominate. Um, and that brings me also to the geograph geographical element. So, so much of the work done to date has been in Europe or America. I and others are really working to try to break out of that and to really understand what's happening in developing countries, for example, um, in Afri on the African content, and not least in Bangladesh and India, work that some of my students are doing. So, uh, while we might be uh, fussing here about uh, pay grades um, and issues around taxation, no, we're talking about real ingrained poverty in some of those developing countries, and I can't help thinking it's probably a bit more important in the end, important as, as um, pay issues are. We need to get those right too. And we also need to look to different organisation forms. I've argued that large firms, it's not all about large firms. I hope I've made that point sufficiently strongly, but neither is it all about private sector business. So we need to look more, and some work is done around this, to the public sector. We need to think about social enterprises. Colleagues here are engaged with that. Cooperatives, state-owned enterprises, you know, they, they need looking at. Some people are starting to make headway there. And, and one that uh, particularly chimes for me and some of my students' work is the informal economy. Now, why is it that we focus on registered businesses when so much of the world is not registered um, you know, and are demonised because of that, but there are many complex issues that we need to, to understand there. So, in short, I suggest we need to keep looking beyond the multinationals, beyond the, su the usual suspects. And so, like, again, a good lecturer, I want to summarise the things that I want you to, to take away, <laughs> your takeaway points from, from this uh, talk. The first is that business ethics is not an oxymoron. Now I feel next person that says to me gets a punch on the nose. <laughs> in a very academic way. Um, it is a way of understanding business and social life. That's, that's my kind of first message for you. The second one is something that I've referred to several times. Rules are not enough. You can have the most beautiful set of principles and rules. If they are not applied in practice, um, then we're in trouble. And so the work I'm doing uh, with colleagues at Copenhagen Business School is around this implementation gap um, that is really a, an intractable one in many cases. Thirdly, moral and social theory can help us to understand, influence and explain business um, through policy and practice. Ultimately, business is society, society is business. And I want to get away from this separation hypo hypothesis. And businesses, you know, the, the question I posed in the, the abstract and the title is, are businesses the cause or the solution to the problems? And of course, no surprise, the answer is they are both. And it's no good disengaging with business if we want to tackle some of the, the problems, and it's no good disengaging with business if we want to identify and reduce some of the causes. Um, and then finally, I'm a big fan of small businesses. It's a complex arena. It's bound to, do, to be with such a diversity of organisational forms, but a lot can be learned from small businesses. Generally, they're seen as the bad guys, the demons. Large firms will say, we need to sort out our supply chain. You know, sometimes I think the supply chain needs to sort out the large firms. You know, the, it, we should go that way too. And then finally, one, one question. Who, who is this? Anybody know? Colleagues, you should. It's Jane Holloway. It's Mrs Holloway, if you like. And I want to just kind of leave you um, with the thought before I do my list of thank yous, like the Oscars. 
um, with that actually we need to get beyond thinking about the, the sort of walls of the business organisation. So rumour has it that it was not actually in the end some a sort of public vote which drove how Thomas Holloway spent his money. But the idea to have a women's higher education college came from his wife. And we fail miserably to take into account the sort of social context and the different gender issues that are related to that in business practice. There is so much more that needs to be done there. So you're lucky, I'm at the end. I'm going to take advantage of the, the stage to do some, some thank yous. Um, particularly um, Professors Demon Morsing and Marta and Sue who've organised the event. Um, I have to say a huge thank you, heartfelt to family and friends um, for their sometimes bemused but nevertheless unwavering support um, for the choices I've made. Um, for those who've gone before me, the senior colleagues who've been super mentors um, for their example and direction. Uh, for my peers, uh, many of whom are co-authors who I've grown up with academically speaking, um, for the good conversations which have gone on for decades now sometimes, it, one of these days will come to a, to a conclusion. And last of all, and by absolutely no means least, I want to thank the next generation, the next generation of um, junior colleagues, student school pupils, um, who I really am frankly in awe of some of the things that they do, um, and who give me real hope that progress is and will continue to be made. So thank you, thank you all. Oh no, or oh, oh, Rosemary's going to... Uh, oh, wait, 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 wait. So, I will now call on Professor Meda Morsing to give the vote of thanks. Uh, Meda is from Copenhagen Business School and she's also a visiting professor at Royal Holloway. Thank you very much. Vice Principal, ladies, gentlemen, Laura's family, <laughs> dear Laura, <laughs> Professor of Business Ethics, I'm honored and I'm humbled and I'm absolutely delighted to stand here today as a respondent at your inaugural lecture. Thank you so much for that. I'm Meta Morsing and I am, uh, I've, I've founded a sister center at Copenhagen Business School about 12 years ago uh, in Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, it is a seldom moment for me to stand here uh, to say out loud in public how much I appreciate your presence in academia and elsewhere. So initially I prepared around a one hour speak <laughs> in your honor. <laughs> I could easily have done three. Uh, but then I met Martha, and she <laughs> said, <laughs> five minutes. Uh, so so this, uh, this response is um, uh, certainly not unbiased. Uh, some would say it's not scientific. Uh, but nevertheless, it is true. So dear Laura, uh, as you very well know, and, uh, but your colleagues here may not know because you have the habit of not flagging your many achievements and your excellent accomplishments uh, very loudly. So we are many, and I say many, many colleagues out there from different institutions across the world who appreciate your academic scholarship and who, you, who appreciate your excellent work, your impactful results, and not least your energetic engagement with all of us and in particular your ongoing open-mindedness to discussion, to discuss with us and question what people sometimes take for granted. So we are many colleagues who over the last years have been pulling and drawing you to our institutions and we keep on doing that, not just to Copenhagen Business School, it's just one of them, uh, to get a little bit of that Laura spirit. The Laura spirit is Unfortunately, I have to say, not something you can buy <laughs> or something you can imitate. Uh, it's quite simply Laura. So it is the spirit of survival. It is the spirit of we will make it no matter what. We will try again. Come on. It is hard work. It is critical. It is a spirit of insisting 
at times difficult to separate from being stubborn. <laughs> I'm sure you'll agree with me over there. <laughs> but it's good, it's really good, because it never escapes into cheap maneuvers to avoid challenges or to avoid unpleasant confrontation. It's rather the Laura spirit that is optimistic and willing to engage, and uh, it sees the potential in everyone without uh, this naivi na naivety, and it's extremely engaging. It is also, importantly, a spirit of uncorrupted commitment, I have to say, and I think that was very clear here in your, in your uh, inaugural lecture, Laura. It is a spirit of grounded values, uh, pursuing a career, yes, but also because you believe in what you do, and you believe that you can actually, with what you do, just change the world a little bit to the better. And I think that's exactly what you're doing. So those of you who have been fortunate enough uh, on a dark and rainy day in January um, to have Laura into your office, you know exactly what that Laura spirit I'm talking about is, is, <laughs> is doing to you. So it's a rare combination all in one tiny little body, but <laughs> there it is. <laughs> so Laura, you are a woman of the world and we, your colleagues, have debated with you at Academy of Management, at the Eagles mm -hmm. annual conferences, even at Academy of Business and Society uh, conferences, Africa Academy of, uh, of Management, and so on and so forth. You have traveled all over the place and you've given keynotes, papers, you've, ta you've taken on 10 consecutive years of, a, of being an associate editor of one of the top journals in our area. And you have also helped us teaching young faculty and you've certainly worked with and inspired the rest of us. I could go on. <laughs> Indeed, Laura, you have set and you have marked, uh, you know, you've set your mark on the academic landscape. Uh, and it is very much CSR and small and medium-sized enterprises. That is where you, your platform and your ground. Uh, it's not the only thing you do, but it has certainly made a, an international uh, mark on, on that landscape. And it's simply not possible to discuss CSR and SMEs without engaging with Laura's work. You have empirically explored, theoretically developed new ways of understanding what CSR does to SMEs and what SMEs do to CSR. And, and I have to remind all of us, because I think now, after the many years of work you have invested, it seems so evident, it seems so natural that there should be such an area, uh, and this is what you have achieved. Um, but so I think that we have to understand that it was not that evident, it was not that natural, but you actually dared to move on and you continued to hold on and to insist, even in times, and they still do, some of them, good colleagues, this is the hello from Andy Crane, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> insist that trying to tell you that uh, multinational companies are more important than small <laughs> and medium-sized enterprises. Well, that may have been the case before Laura started to make us <laughs> all aware of the other types of importance that SMEs have for our society. So we'll tell him that. <laughs> So you insisted, you in believe that the 99% of all businesses are SMEs and that there actually has got to be some importance and some impact to society that uh, uh, sort of deserves and keep on deserving our attention. So thank you for that. You are indeed an international scholar and while you are grounded in a Western perspective, uh, you have also reached out to see CSR and business ethics from another side of the world recently and that is Africa. This is exciting. We'll see where it takes you and where it takes us, mm. I hope. Um, but importantly, this again for me is a sign of you not choosing the easy route, uh, but following your own inclination to be challenged, to explore, to be surprised and to learn. So Laura, um, you and I, over the last 10 years, we've been discussing CSR, we've been traveling in African local buses. <laughs> We have been uh, discussing CSR, uh, standing in the midst of a revolution in Athens, in Greece. Mm -hmm. We have uh, got lost in Ljubljana. We have discussed Foucault in Disneyland. <laughs> Can you believe it? Yeah. And, uh, and, and m most importantly, maybe, uh, we have agreed on that our absolute two favorite boys' names in the world three maybe, <laughs> but there's Robert, Adam and Peter. <laughs> so we do agree on that. <laughs> um, 
But we have also, uh, and we continue to do that, discuss the meaning and nature of men. Men, I said, again <laughs> and again. <laughs> and there's a lot more to be discussed on that and debated on the gender side of things, mm -hmm. where I know you also take a, um, a big investment in of your time uh, to pursue that uh, very important agenda. So, Laura, <coughs> um, you know that your second scholarly home, that is Copenhagen Business School, uh, and so finally I bring to you here today to Royal Holloway, <laughs> you from your friends in Royal Copenhagen, <laughs> uh, to an almost, at least in my view, royal woman, <laughs> uh, Professor of Business Ethics, congratulations. Oh, Laura. thank you. <laughs> a good job. I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. Oh, oh. Oh, thank you. Did I do okay? Yeah. <gasps>